to be here in Inuvik. I could speak to you during your sessions. And by welcoming uh, the delegates to Canada, Canada's north, and especially those uh, who have traveled across the circumpolar regions to be here today. I would also like to thank uh, Inuit Circumpolar Council, uh, Mr. Akhluk Lin, for inviting me uh, and giving me the honor to address the ICC's 12th General Assembly. To be here uh, this afternoon uh, in, in this room with so many people who have contributed positively to the history of Inuit is a once in a lifetime opportunity. And many of you I have known, been friends with, and looked up to my whole life. And it is truly special for me to be here. This event uh, provides a major opportunity to discuss common priorities to look back at our past while establishing a vision for Inuit across the circumpolar regions so that we can continue to move forward as a people. I would like to talk today about the strength and the influence of Inuit, our important contributions and our common bonds across the Arctic and about our future. As some of you may know, I was born here in Inuvik and was raised in the Qitermiu region of Nunavut. And having lived in the north my whole life, I am so proud to call it my home. And like anyone uh, who is proud of where they come from, I am not hesitant to promote it and fight for it. In fact, that is why I chose to enter public service to be a voice of the North, to be a voice of Northerners in the South. And in October 2008, I was elected to serve as Member of Parliament for Nunavut. So that same month, the Prime Minister honored me by appointing me as Minister of Health for Canada. And this event was notable, not just for me personally, but for all Inuit, as the Prime Minister had just appointed the first Inuit to ca uh, cabinet in Canadian history. So building on this, in August of 2012, the Prime Minister, Prime Minister Harper, appointed me as Canada's Minister for the Arctic Council. And this is notable for two reasons. First, the appointment of a dedicated minister for the Arctic Council is the first for Canada. It reflects the importance that our government attaches to the North, to the Arctic Council, and to our chairmanship of the Council. Secondly, the appointment of someone who was born and raised in the Arctic to this newly created role reflects the importance placed upon the traditional knowledge and experience that people of the North can bring to the table. And further, it highlights the importance we place in allowing Northerners to make decisions about their future. So I will touch more on the traditional knowledge in a moment, but I want to finish uh, this thought with an important point. Inuit now have a voice at the cabinet table, and I will ensure the interests of the North are heard. As I mentioned earlier, uh, in August of 2012, I became Canada's Minister of the Arctic Council, and on May the 13th, 2013, I took over chairmanship on behalf of Canada. The Arctic Council is a leading form for cooperation on Arctic issues, and there is no country better suited than Canada to lead this organization at a time that the Arctic is undergoing so much change. In shaping the Arctic Council chairmanship, I wanted to know how we can shape the future and destinies of those living in the Arctic. I wanted to know what do we have to do during Canada's chairmanship to leave a lasting impact for the people of Canada's north. 
So in order to do this, I knew it was important to consult directly with people from across the north to hear from them how they wanted Canada to approach the two years of chairmanship. After all, the people of the Arctic are the world's true Arctic experts. So no one would better be placed to give advice. The message was clear. The well-being and prosperity of people living in the North must be at the forefront of the Arctic Council priorities. So for this reason, Canada is putting Northerners first at the Arctic Council, and we have made the overarching theme of our chairmanship development for the people of the North. So put it, to put it another way, Canada has made it clear to the world that we are determined to see Arctic communities benefit from the economic boom that is unfolding in their regions. So that being said, development must be done in a responsible and environmentally sustainable manner so that the land, the water, and the animals that many northern, northern people still depend upon are not negatively impacted. So ultimately, we established 11 priorities under Canada's chairmanship. But today I wanted to speak to just a few of those as I think they tie nicely to a number of the other discussions you will be having throughout the course of this General Assembly. So specifically I would like to touch on the importance of cooperation across the Arctic. The incorporation of traditional knowledge, promoting the traditional way of life, and the impact on the people and on the way of life of actions taken by environmental groups. As I mentioned earlier, it is important to look at our past. By understanding our past, we can appreciate and be proud of the impact and influence that Inuit have had on the history and on the heritage of Canada. It is safe to say uh, that people who live in the Arctic are experts in what it takes to survive, to thrive in a region as harsh as the Arctic. And of course, we are not the only ones who think so. So one only needs to look to my hometown of Joe Haven, Oksuktok, to understand this. For those of you who are not aware, Joe Haven gets his name from the boat that Roland Amundsen used to explore Canada's Arctic at the beginning of the 20th century. Amundsen was the first person to navigate the Northwest Passage. Unfortunately, his small boat, his ship, the Joe, became trapped in the ice off King William Sound, off King William Sound in a remote area we now call Joe Haven, my hometown. And he and his crew ended up staying there for two winters. During that time, Amundsen developed a close relationship with Inuit and learned from their traditional knowledge. And Inuit were able to give Amundsen the tools and, and teach his crew how to survive in the harsh climate and conditions of the Arctic. Several years later, Amundsen once again went exploring the Earth's extreme polar regions, and this time the South Pole. He, ultimately, he was ultimately successful, but what is notable here is that he stressed that the traditional knowledge he had gained from Inuit of Canada's north had been invaluable to his success. And I love this story as it is a great example of the value that Inuit bring to the world stage. So for example, there's another famous Arctic explorer, Sir John Franklin, who did not have the advantage of Inuit traditional knowledge. And as many of you know, 
Franklin's journey was not as successful as Amundsen, and to this day, we are searching for his boat off my, uh, outside of my hometown. So the Amundsen story is, a great, is great for another reason as well. I believe it highlights the bonds and the connections across the Arctic nations. So for example, last year I traveled to Oslo, uh, Norway, to, uh, as my role as Minister of Environment. And however, when I am visiting a place, I like to learn a bit about the places and places' history and their stories. So while in Oslo, I visited the Fram Museum. And at that museum, they have an entire exhibit on Amundsen's journey, and they even have his boat, the Joan, display. So 5,000 kilometers away from my home, this wasn't just a Norwegian history. This was also a piece of Canadian and Inuit history on display. It was an amazing experience for me as I walked through the museum and saw pictures of my hometown. And in fact, they even had a picture of my mother at a community gathering on display. So this experience made it very clear to me just how connected Arctic peoples are and how by working together that we can have a major impact on the world stage. And this is exactly why Canada's Arctic Council priorities of putting Northerners first is so important. There are people who live in the North and we are the experts. As I mentioned earlier, Northerners also need to be able to benefit from the economic prosperities that are that is occurring in the Arctic. And so during Canada's chairmanship, the Arctic states and permanent participants are establishing a circumpolar business forum called the Arctic Economic Council or the AEC. The AEC will be an independent body of business representatives who will work to facilitate business opportunities, trade and investments in the Arctic in the best interest of Northerners. Through their participation in the AEC, these representatives will help to ensure that a diverse range of businesses are involved in making decisions that promote sustainable economic development across the Arctic. The first meeting of the AEC will take place September the 2nd and 3rd in Iqaluit, and I look forward to hosting this meeting, and certainly I encourage all of you who are interested to learn more. When you look around the world, oftentimes it is easy to get caught up in the agendas that some environmental groups like to push without considering the human dimension. The reality is that there are lots of environmental groups who say they can speak for and represent Inuit or Aboriginal people, while at the same time they campaign against our traditional way of life like the seal hunt. And these groups do not base these campaigns on facts or science or traditional knowledge but instead on what they view to be their moral high ground. The ironic part is that from their moral high grounds, they completely disregard the rights and traditions of entire group of people. So for example, in 1970s, the Greenpeace began their famous campaign of misinformation against the seal hunt. The devastating impact of this campaign still lingers today. At the end of the day, Inuit were victims, victims of misinformation and lies spread by a group that had no regard for their impact on our way of life. And just recently, actually, Greenpeace published an editorial in which they apologized and admitted their campaign against our commercial sealing hunt 
hurt many both economically and culturally. An apology is great, but it doesn't undo the damage that Inuit communities have felt as a direct result of their actions. So this is a perfect illustration of why it is so important for Inuit to stand up for their way of life. Other people who are not our friends will try to use Inuit as their weapons in their own battles. We have to think bigger than that. We have to ask, what are the battles that are important to us, to Inuit? We have to ask, how do we take control of our own future? So it is very clear that a strong Arctic Council agenda that puts Northerners first is absolutely necessary. But let's not forget the important role that ICC plays, and as you know, the Arctic Council also has six permanent participant organizations representing indigenous people of the North at the table with the Arctic states. And that includes the Inuit Circumpolar Council, which is the voice of Inuit at the Arctic Council. I have seen firsthand how ICC provides the knowledge and insight to help inform the important work of the Arctic Council. One initiative where the ICC could help be helpful in is in the area of mental wellness. And this initiative also happens to be one of Canada's chairmanship priorities as well. And the main objective of this project is to develop recommendations that highlight the successful mental wellness promotion strategies. This will enable communities across the Arctic, Arctic to Arctic, to better support and promote the wellness of our people. I know that the ICC has also contributed to the Arctic Council's work through projects to assess and promote indigenous language as well as the Arctic Council's Arctic Marine Shipping Assessment and these contributions have been very helpful. And these efforts will help Inuit adapt to a changing world while maintaining our tradition, our cultures, and our way of life. So I would like to leave you with some thoughts for you to consider over the course of this week's General Assembly. As we move forward, Inuit will face many new challenges as well as opportunities. The North is changing and we need to ask ourselves how we can work together in our best interests. The challenges exist for a number of reasons. Increased development, increased shipping, or climate change. However, the strength and resiliency of Inuit is amazing. Through the Arctic Council and other forms, Canada is putting in, the, putting in place the conditions to allow Inuit to shape their own destiny, but governments can't do it all. And the people have to be willing as well. We are now at a point in our history that sees most Inuit with settled land claims. Through our land claim agreements, we have some of the strongest environmental regimes imaginable. In Canada, the incorporation of traditional knowledge and consultation is mandated by law because of our agreements. We have institutes of public governance that allow Inuit to determine what projects happen and how things proceed. We have all the tools in front of us to allow us to turn our challenges into opportunities. But that's the key point. 
We need to seize this moment and get back into the driver's seat. We need to stand up against those who would use us to push their own agendas. And we need to ensure that our traditional knowledge, our traditional way of life continues to exist and that our traditional knowledge is incorporated into decision making. So by keeping Inuit at the table, by allowing Inuit to benefit from economic prosperity, by incorporating Inuit traditional knowledge and experiences with modern science, I have no doubt that we can overcome any challenge. So in closing, I wish you all the best over the next four days of the General Assembly. And I want to once again thank all of you for the honor of letting me speak to you today.